When it comes to fans, it is a fan's right mm -hmm. to have whatever opinion they want to have. And people are going to be upset because, especially when it, you're talking about books or games, because you're never going to be the exact person who they had in their head or who they played on Witcher 3, for example. I don't necessarily consider that toxic. I just consider that passionate. Mm -hmm. Welcome to The Hollywood Scholar, I'm Jed Morgan, and it's been several weeks since Henry Cavill left The Witcher, but it is only now that the Access and mainstream medias are doing their customary things of coping, and in one instance, attacking the fans for their opinions on this situation. It's just kind of delayed, and I'm very, very surprised to see that happen, and partially I believe that it has something to do with how much traction the petition to replace the writers is getting currently, because most articles reference that as their inspiration for writing it. So, maybe this petition is doing something, maybe not with Netflix, but it is scaring the access and mainstream media to the point where they're putting out these shill articles in defense of the decision, and in defense of the new Witcher prequel Blood Origin getting ratioed to hell and back on YouTube on both the Netflix YouTube channel and the Witcher YouTube channel. But before we get into all that, I wanted to check the petition again. We are at 216,000 signatures. That is incredibly impressive. Looks like it's, yeah, still 216,000. It's still quite a bit. I didn't think it was going to have this much impact. This is more impact than I thought just with the access of mainstream media freaking out to this degree. CBR, forget Henry Cavill, The Witcher has everything it needs. Michelle Yao. Now I love Michelle Yao, shoes and everything everywhere all at once, Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon. She's a phenomenal actress, but she does not have the star power of Henry Cavill. And he definitely fits the role better than she does. And it's okay to say, but they're just like, uh, we gotta, it's, it's to the level of them, she'll be our also saying, no, that's okay, Yennefer's better anyway. <laughs> It's on that level of absolute stupidity, but this article really doesn't have a whole lot of evidence in it, as the Shield BR articles never actually do. But there is this interesting segment that I wanted to talk about. Michelle Yao could be the Ahsoka Tano of the Witcher universe. When I first read that, I was like, what the hell are you talking about? And apparently it's like, Ahsoka just shows up in a lot of shows and stuff. Michelle Yao can just show up in a lot of shows. It's kind of difficult with her separated by 1200 years from the main show. I, I guess, and Ahsoka is just a weird comparison, but all right. And they go on to say, Sapkowski never went full George R. R. Martin on the world of the Witcher books. He left the past mysterious, so the storytellers working on Blood Origin have the chance to define their characters free of preconceived notion. To a certain extent, that is correct. It's not in a super amount of detail, but there are three pivotal events that are in a certain amount of detail. And those events take place over 1,500 years, and they've taken all three of these events and condensed them down into the show, and they're bastardizing those events. The only three things that they had to get right are the things that they're getting wrong, and the thing that they're focusing on. That takes some next level still of bastardization and debauchery to do that. You only had three, three things you had to get right. If you didn't want to worry about those three things, Set it in 1200 years, which nothing actually happened there in the real lore, and just have a side story about a bunch of elves. Totally fine, but the fact that you're condensing the three events of importance is a problem. So, yes, it's not as defined as the George R. R. Martin books, but it is defined enough that they're bastardizing the lore, and this isn't an accurate statement by Shilby R. But that point of ignorance that I don't blame she'll be for saying that I just wanted to point that out and they go on to say they could spin off blood origin in any number of directions and appearances of Yao could anchor them to each like Ahsoka Tano has connected Star Wars properties still a really weird perspective to take while Henry Cavill's departure is a huge loss Michelle Yao is huge enough to replace him as the face of the franchise that still I don't agree with she's not as big of a star as he is she's great I love her but she's nowhere near on the level of stardom that Henry Cavill is but at least this one is admitting that it sucks that Henry Cavill's gone it's a weird perspective and some weird choices, but not necessarily as antagonistic as some of these other articles that we're going to be covering are. And in a weird mirror to this, a little bit beforehand, Variety also put out an article about Michelle Yao being good enough. No Henry Cavill? No problem. Thanks to Michelle Yao. And this is a very short article where they don't actually talk about that at all. See how short that is? They don't, like... They don't even mention why it's better that Michelle Yao is. It's just a couple facts. It's kind of weird coming from Variety, but that that was an interesting one that I had to throw in the mix. And one here is really kind of offensive to Liam's Hemsworth, but this one is saying Henry Cavill was always too pretty for Geralt of Rivia. 
He was too pretty, so this is a good thing. No, that's what the makeup was for. That's what the scars are for. And the show started out very young in Geralt's life. He wasn't too pretty. Geralt isn't an unattractive man in the books and the games. This is a really weird argument to justify a recasting of Geralt. It's like, oh yeah, he was too pretty. So let's have a freaking Hemsworth brother replace him. Hemsworth brothers are kind of known for being hot. Just gonna say it. So you take one super masculine, ruggedly handsome man for a pretty boy. How is this defending your position? And yeah, it's saying Liam Hemsworth to be a better Geralt in appearance at least. So, oh, Henry Cavill's too pretty. So let's get an uglier man. CBR is completely insane here. This is just a really weird argument to have through all of this. But finally, there is one golden nugget of an article that I wanted to focus primarily on. And this is the one that goes antagonistic, attacks the fans, causes toxic, all the customary things that we've come to know and love. And it's from... Kotaku, that paragon of virtue, Kotaku. Same people who called Stray racist, even though there were no people in the game. It's like, you're following on Cat. Yeah, Cat's a racist. I'm sorry. What? Yeah, Kotaku, someplace I, I really trust for journalistic integrity. But they have an article saying, Witcher fans are convinced they know the real reason Henry Cavill left the Netflix series. Ultimately, that's innocuous was enough title. But once we get into it, things can get quite profound. So they start out with... You know, Superman speculation, stuff like that, describing the events that had happened, Liam Hemsworth replacing him, and Liam Hemsworth's previous filmography, but this is when it gets really good. Subreddits for the books, games, and Netflix series blew up with disbelief, frustration, and memes when the recasting was announced, while conspiracy theories got passed around on Twitter that Cavill had been more or less forced out over creative differences with the production that had at times taken generous liberties with the author's original novels. Yes, they took a lot, a lot of liberties. Now, I don't think he was forced out necessarily, but you could have an argument for that. But it started out really, really strong there, conspiracy theories, even though there's quite a bit of evidence to support that in one way or another. I personally think it was voluntary and he got out as soon as possible, but they're already starting out really strong. But it's this next sentence where they go full ham fist. Certain parts of the Witcher fandom have always had a toxic relationship with the show. Of course we're toxic because we don't like a awful show. Fuming over certain casting choices and plot deviations were justified in having whatever opinions we like, as Henry Cavill so beautifully put it. Why is this a problem? Why are we getting all toxic for not liking casting choices and plot deviations, especially when you traded out gold for garbage? What is Kotaku trying to say here? If you don't agree with us and Netflix 100%, you're just toxic. And Cavill's departure is now being taken as validation of every criticism they've ever had. It is. It really is because he's had the same sort of criticism in as much like politically polite way possible that he's been able to get out there. But he said stuff like, hey, I, I, I'm focused on this story. I will be involved in this show as long as I stay focused to the books. He said, hey, I'm always giving them notes on how to be more book accurate. The Roach death scene is a great example of him fighting for a more book accurate moment. It's validation because it is. We're not taking it as some amorphous, oh, we're like toxic and like we hate people and racism and stuff. And since Henry Cavill left, we're rightsies and you're wrongsies. What is wrong with Kotaku? This is the argument that they're having. Now they just kind of go into a little, a little bit more of the behind the scenes, the evidence that these conspiracy theorists and toxic fans are using to justify their positions, such as interviews with Henry Cavill, specifically the comments made by DeMeo, an ex-Witcher writer who said a lot of writers actively disliked the source material, and Laura Hissridge comments about how she really didn't like working with Henry Cavill because he was very hard to work with. He was always trying to do creative excellence, trying to get adaptation properly. And her comments where she said that she specifically hired writers who don't know anything about the Witcher lore. So they're using real evidence. They're, they're talking about the evidence that really does add up to the conclusions a lot of us toxic fans have made. See what that conclusion looks like from their end. After all this evidence, this great evidence to support it, this is what they decide to call the toxic fans. They say, some fans takeaways from these sound bites have had that Histridge was focused on making the show that she wanted it to be. Cavill was the only one interested in trying to keep it grounded in the visual version of the characters. That is a justifiable conclusion from all that evidence that they just laid out. But we're toxic because we inferred logically from a lot of evidence, and they call them breadcrumbs here. 
We added it together and we're toxic for doing that. And they even add it together in a really concise and logical manner. But their conclusion is just like, oh yeah, this evidence, this evidence, this evidence, great evidence, evidence, evidence. <gasps> oh, conclusion. Oh, that's racist, toxic. Oh, it's completely insane that you would have come to the same conclusion that we inferred just a moment ago. Kotaku is completely insane. Insane. And then they attempt to justify Liam Hensworth casting is better because he'll let them do whatever they want. And that's better for a lead actor. This is insane coming from Kotaku. I mean, it's everything we expect from Kotaku, but these are some insane takes. And of course, we're all toxic. We're used to that. Anytime that we don't agree with the big corporate machines that is Hollywood and the access of mainstream media, we're called all the hateful names in the book. It's a matter of disagreement, not a matter of those labels actually being accurate. We've seen this so, so many times. And it's just weird that these articles took so long to actually come out. And I do think the only thing that could explain their delayed reaction to the casting announcement is because of how successful the petition is being. And another major effect that this petition and these articles have been having and the effects of Henry Cavill's replacement are these Witcher Blood origin trailers getting ratioed to hell and back. This is the official Netflix version of the trailer with 1.3 million views, has 70,000 dislikes. That's really, really impressive, really next level. I support it 100%. And then there's the actual Witcher version of the trailer, which also has 10,000 dislikes with 149,000 views. Some really, really impressive stuff. And the comments are what we're used to seeing these days, you know, the mocking, combining genres together. A lot of them talking about the writer's room, Henry Cavill's replacement. And it's really great to see a fandom standing up like this. Besides Rings of Power, I've never seen a fandom so united against a terrible decision and fighting for an actor to this extent because we all know the show is terrible, but we know it's going to be far worse without Henry Cavill being there. So these fans are just trying to say, hey, let's fix this by keeping Henry and firing the writers. That's not an inconsistent statement. The show would, is really bad, worse without him, so let's try to fix it. It's a logical progression based on the evidence provided. And I'm just really, really happy to see a fan base united in something so amazing as the aversion to Netflix's bastardization of The Witcher. But anyway, that's all I have for today. I'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments below. Please like and subscribe and we'll see you in the next video. Anon. If you like what I do here and want to see good, compelling stories that Hollywood will no longer give you, Check out my book series, Odyssey of a Phoenix, a mythological epic about philosophy, morality, and modern-day mental illness issues. Books 1, Down in Flames, and Book 2, Apocalypse Then, currently on sale. Book 3, Kill the Dark, coming soon.